Hi guys, how are you? Uh, welcome to a very dreary Brisbane. Today I'm going to do a quick video reply to uh, uh, a video that a guy called Justin Case has made uh, in an attempt to refute the video that I showed uh, with MPP Solar's gear basically not living up to expectations. Now, let me start this with something. I've been working with MPP Solar for a whole year to get through these issues. The reasons that I've made these videos are not to shoot down MPP Solar. They're an exasperated last resort because MPP Solar aren't listening. And I don't want other people to make the same mistake. You'll see in each of, each of my videos, at the base of the video, uh, I've got links, link, factual links to uh, technical papers and documents that back up what I'm saying. So I'm not filling these videos with pseudoscience or getting a motive about them, I'm just saying it like it is. Okay, so on that basis what I want to do is uh, address each of Justin Case's comments about my battery system um, one by one. He basically brings up three points. In the video you'll see that I've got my camera with me, uh, I'm taking a quick video of the charge controllers that are inside my office. Uh, I see that they're way above the set point and then I run around to the battery bank and basically there I turn off the isolator. And in the process I open up my battery bank and uh, what just in case is uh, uh, on his high horse about is, is the way that my battery bank is set up. Uh, he says three points. First of all, all my cables are different sizes as in different widths. I'm using different types of cables in there. The second one is that the lengths of my cables are all different. Um, uh, and third one is that I don't have a fuse. Okay, so let me explain something about my system. I, when you see me run around, the battery bank is on the direct other side of the wall to the inverters and the solar charge controllers. So I have to run out and around, probably around about 10 meters to get there. But the distance between the battery bank and, uh, and the charge controllers is only 800 millimeters of cable, okay? So, <clears throat> if you add up the total length, that 800 millimeters for the positive and negative cable, and then you add up the total length um, of cable within the battery bank between each battery, uh, the total length is 2.6 meters, which I think is quite dramatically different to just in cases length. Hence the reason that he's using a, a thicker cable. The thing that you've got to understand about cable sizing is that as you lengthen the cable for any given width of cable, um, two things happen. There's a voltage drop and there's an increase in heat generation. So when you're designing your system, you actually need to go to a set of tables and look at your maximum likely current that's going through that cable and the length. Now I actually designed my system on the basis of a 3 metre length and as I said the total length is only 2.6 metres. And uh, that came out considering a 50 amp load per series of batteries. Remember I've got three series and they have three individual lengths of cable coming back through to my main bus which is uh, in, the, uh, in the office. Um, the total carrying capacity for 50 amps you could use 6 AWG cable. This is 4AWG cable, so it's actually thicker than 6AWG cable. Uh, the weighted current, current carrying capacity at that length with a 1% voltage drop for 4AWG is around about between, depending upon which table you use, between 40 and 80 amps, right? That's with 1%. It's acceptable to have a 2 or 3% loss. It's all about uh, making your, your system energy efficient. It's not about ripple or, or DC inductance or, or anything that uh, any of those buzzwords that just in case is using without actually justifying what he's saying. Now, the second thing, the second point is he says that all my batteries are different lengths. Sorry, all my battery cables are different lengths. Yeah, they are, but at every point within the system if you have a look at this, I hope you can see it. Consider that's my first series of batteries. Consider that's my second series of batteries and that's my third series of batteries. From the positive edge of the battery back to the bus is 300 millimeters. On each series, 300 millimeters, 300 millimeters. 
from the first battery to the second battery is 200 mil millimeters. All through, 200 millimeters, same position in each series. The second to the third is only 20 millimeters long in my battery bank. All throughout. The third to the fourth, 200 millimeters. Uh, and from the negative back to the bus, 300 millimeters. As an example, I haven't taken apart my whole battery bank to justify this, but I've taken the negative bus leads. So these are the leads that come from each series back to the negative bus. Let's have a look at them. Pretty close in length, eh? Let's have a look at the positive series. Again, three of them for each series. Same length. Where, just in case, is getting uh, a bit confused, I think, is that when you're running series of batteries, you need to make sure that every single series has the same length of cable, the same total length within each series. Otherwise, what tends to happen is there'll be a very slight difference in resistance um, from the positive to the negative bus of each series, and you'll tend to load up one bank more than the other. So it's just a standard design that you need to have that total length of cable, i.e. the total resistance in cable within each series, the same. You can see I have absolutely the same. Uh, almost to the millimetre. Uh, and he pointed out, I don't have fuses. Well, there you go, that's a DC circuit breaker. I previously used to use a fusible link. Uh, then I see that he criticises that I use um, audio wire. Well, audio wire is um, actually designed to be very, very low in internal resistance. It's probably more expensive and much heavier than the cable that he uses. This copper cable. I chose that for a reason. It's very, very low resistance. So, basically, uh, as said, here we've got each of these fused at 50 amps. 50 amps by 48 volts equals 7,200 watts in total. That's the total surge capacity. Um, the AC side of the inverter is uh, is uh, has basically got a circuit breaker on it at 16 amps, which is about, or oh, off the top of my head, about 3.6 kilowatts. Uh, and that inverter is only supplying uh, one small area of my office. So the actual load on that inverter is very, very, very rarely ever above three kilowatts. And I can guarantee these cables that I've got so much criticism about, they never get even slightly warm. They're well within the requirements for 48 volts. I guess a few of you guys are used to seeing uh, 12 or 24 volt systems, but the reason in telecommunications that we use 48 volt systems is that you don't need thick cable. You save a lot of money on copper. Basically, as you halve it, you have to at least double the, the width of the copper. As you halve the voltage, you have to at least double the width of the copper. Um, so, yep, I've been, I've over-engineered this system, in fact. Okay, let's now talk about his contention that uh, I used all different sizes of cable. I think what he's talking about is this. And this here, for you, just in case, is something that you need to be very careful about. Let me educate you. In 12 volt systems, we've spoken about uh, matching up cable lengths. That's all good. You talk about uh, the internal resistance of a battery being 100 hertz. I think you're getting a bit confused there. Uh, hertz is a measure of frequency. Ohms is a measure of resistance. And if you're talking about, for instance, 100 milliohms being the internal resistance, it's not something that's solid in a battery. In fact, as a battery ages, the internal resistance of a battery will change. And as a battery charges, the internal resistance of a battery will change. And if you have a look at my other videos, you'll see that what I'm talking about is that as the battery is charging, uh, it's basically not able to act as a capacitor and it's not filtering out the ripple that is being created by the inverter and the solar charge controls. It's not being filtered out. So one of my attempts and helping that situation is something called a Zener regulator. And these are Zener regulators. Yeah, they look messy, it's a bit agricultural, but it works. And what happens there is that it's each individual battery gets up to close to 100% charge. It'll start to bleed off charge. 
so that you keep all of your batteries in balance. Otherwise, what happens as, you, as your battery bank ages, and I think you're going to experience this just in case, is um, the internal resistance of individual batteries within each series will change. And what the net effect is that you'll draw down on one, set, on one battery in each series more overnight than the others, and also uh, you'll tend to overcharge one battery in your series uh, more than others. And what that does is it reduces the lifespan of the batteries as a whole. So you end up with a catastrophic failure of one battery, which gets very, very expensive. I noticed that it appears that you have absolutely no protection on your batteries. You need to have a talk to some guys that are very experienced with batteries. So for instance, um, uh, the electric vehicle crowd. You'll see they all have protection on their batteries, Xena protection, which you don't. So those cables that you're talking about, they're only designed to carry an infinitesimal current about 200 milliamps. They're across each battery and that's the purpose of them there. So when you break it all down, actually, I think you'll find just in case my system's pretty well designed. There's been a lot of thought put into it. Thanks very much. Uh, no, I'm going to add one more thing. The other thing that just in case doesn't talk about is the design of the inverter and the design of the solar charge controller. What I've pointed out in my videos, we're going back to the fact that I'm not criticising MPP Solar here. Uh, we've experienced these failures. As I said, I was one of the first people to get these inverters um, in Australia. When we've been having the problems, the thing that is dying is this capacitor. This capacitor is a DC bus capacitor. In inverter systems, the DC bus capacitor is always the weak point. It's there, it's designed to it's designed to filter out ripple current created by the action of the MOSFETs um, turning the DC current into a square wave. Uh, usually the, the general standard is um, to maximise the life of an inverter you have um, a capacitor that's got a very uh, low um, equivalent series resistance or ESR and generally uh, you try to have a voltage rating on that capacitor of double the maximum expected bus voltage. These capacitors are rated at 63 volts. Now I don't know about you, but when my batteries are charging, their, um, their absorbed voltage is 58.4 volts, and you expect them to go a little bit above and a little bit below. Um, having 63 volt capacitors is not enough headroom. It is not enough headroom. Um, when these things, they have a lifetime rating, so their expected lifetime under uh, harsh conditions, and those kind of harsh conditions would be when you're running high voltages through them and high ripple currents. Um, the expected lifetime of these is 2,000 hours, which is absolutely nothing. They've cheaped out on these capacitors. In the, uh, in the actual charge controllers, the capacitors that they've got in them, in them are a lot uh, heavier duty. So, you know, they're gonna last quite a long time. But the weakest link in the system is failing and that's this capacitor the capacitor that is in the inverter and when that fails it blows up the MOSFETs it's got nothing to do with my cables it's got everything to do with design please explain that just in case have a great day